Some years ago, there was a young man who struggled with the appropriate way to show physical affection. He didn't know if when he greeted someone after seeing them after a long time, he didn't know whether to, to embrace them or, or knuckle bump them or shake their hand or bow or, or whatever. So, so he went to the place where he could find an answer to his conundrum. Now, this is before Google and before Siri and Alexa. So he went to the local library. And he went up and down the shelves, and he looked, and he found the book that would answer his question. A book along the spine said, How to Hug. He thought, this may work. So he checked it out, took it home, but was disappointed to learn when he opened it up that it was not about physical affection, but simply was one volume in a set of encyclopedias. H-O-W to H-U-G. You know, it's, it's, it's really impossible for us to, to totally grasp the Scriptures. Even after many years, and many of you have studied many years the Bible, and, and it's hard to grasp all the nuances of the Scriptures because it's puzzling. If you read the Old Testament, uh, you, it seems that God portrays himself as a God of judgment. And, and the thing that seems to be emphasized is the law and judgment and wrath. And remember God told the Israelites, don't touch Mount Sinai because if you do, you'll be put to death. And sinners were struck down with earthquakes and plagues. And, and so it seems that the Old Testament teaches about a God of judgment and a God of wrath. But if you turn to the New Testament, we see a different kind of God, it seems. A, a God who, who emphasizes forgiveness and mercy and kindness and gentleness. The story of a God-man who's willing to go to the cross for the sake of his people, you and me. So how do we reconcile what appears to be the wrath and the judgment of the Old Testament with the mercy and love of the New Testament? How do we put together this dichotomy in appearing to be two different kinds of gods, perhaps? So some of us might approach the Scriptures and, and believe that it only speaks about our guilt and our shame. And some approach the Scripture believing that, that God's judgment is on us. He's some kind of a killjoy up there ready to, to beat us over the head. And, and, and does it say in the Bible that, that God just puts up with us? I don't think so. Does it, does it say in the Bible that he doesn't really love us? I don't think so. And, and, but it seems that all he wants sometimes is our punishment and our pain. And, and God almost seems to be delight in in making us live in fear. That's what it looks like at, on the surface of the Old Testament. So if we believe in a God like that, then we need to be selective in the other passages that we read as well. We need to ignore passages that don't seem to support this idea of God as a God of wrath and a God of judgment. We need to kind of spin those passages that, that make God a God of mercy if we believe and, and read through the lenses of, of his wrath and his judgment. For some people, the Scripture becomes a book that condemns us. This is not unusual. And this is the reason why some non-believers choose not to be a part of us, because who would want a God like that? Who would be attracted to a God that, that is a God of judgment, and a God of wrath, and a God that simply condemns us? I don't believe the Bible teaches that when you look at the Bible as a whole. So we may not see God as a God who condemns us, but we might see God perhaps as, as one who's ready to love us if we straighten up our own lives enough so that he accepts us into his fellowship. You know, we, it, it might be a God that we may think that, that we study all the instructions in the Bible. And the Bible uses all kinds of words for instructions. You know these words, commandments, decrees, precepts, statues, directives. There's a whole lot of those in the Bible. And if we try to be good enough, if we try to make ourselves good enough, then, then we, we think that somehow we'll come into his grace. The problem with, with this view of God, though, is that it means that the responsibility to fix ourselves is ours. And, and we need to fix our own selves in order to be accepted by God. 
So rather than being a scripture that perhaps condemns us, as some people believe, to some of us, the scripture might be a scripture that corrects us. That's not very uncommon because many people interpret Scripture in that way that salvation is a result of us doing good things. If we just kind of go to church enough, if we just tithe enough, if we just pray enough, if we just do enough good, then we'll be good enough for God. There's a comedy on Netflix called The Good Place. It's kind of a silly comedy. But it describes what to some heaven might be like. And and there's a man, Ted Danson, plays the part of the angel that's in charge of the good place. And so he has all the new inductees there. He's sitting in front of a a big screen on a lawn. and, And about 100 people in lawn chairs are in front of him. And he says to them, do you know how you got here? And they all, you know, shake their heads. We don't know how we got here. And this is what Ted Danson says in this comedy called The Good Place. He says this. Every action on earth has a positive or a negative value, depending on how much good or bad that action puts into the universe. When you die, we calculate the total value of your life. Only the people with the highest scores get to come to the good place. Now, it's a silly comedy, but you know, a lot of people believe that when you come down to it. If we have enough good points, we go to the good place. It's a point system, and you ask someone out there what gets to heaven, they'll probably say, if I'm good enough, if I do enough good, then I'll get to the good place. Faith by works, by doing stuff for him. The problem is, if we look at a scripture as a a scripture that condemns us, or a scripture that corrects us, then we totally miss the point of God's love And God's grace that he offers us that is all the way through scriptures. So if we see scriptures as condemning us, we miss the fact in God's word that he loves us with an immeasurable love. And as the songster sang, he embraces us with his love. We miss the fact that as corrupted as we may be, that he will always love us. Always, just like our own children, no matter what they do, they may try us, but we still love them, don't we? We may not approve of their choices, but we still love them, don't we? And they may face consequences for their actions, but we still love them, don't we? That's the love that God has for you and me. So we may not see scriptures as condemning us, but if we see scriptures as correcting us, then we're always trying to do better, trying to be good enough, trying to do the right things to reshape ourselves so that God can come near to us and we're never quite there, are we? Luke chapter 8, verse 26, says this. They sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, which is across the lake from Galilee. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High? I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had commanded the impure spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him, and though he was chained hand and foot and kept under guard, he'd broken his chains and had been driven by the demon into solitary places. And Jesus asked him, What is your Name? This man was not welcome anywhere. This man was from a local town, but he didn't live in that local town. This man lived in caves in the hills where dead bodies were placed. This was his home. The locals wouldn't go near him because they were terrified of him. And because he was, of course, ceremonially unclean being around dead bodies and living there. He was naked, the Bible tells us. His clothes had long gone from his body. Nobody cared for this man. Probably very few people knew, even knew his name. He was a madman. He was tormented by evil spirits. He was a problem. How many times do you think he'd been ridiculed by people? How many times did people run away from him? 
How many times had this man been hurt emotionally and physically by the people of that village? Even when he first saw Jesus, his first response was, what do you want with me? He said, please don't torture me. Perhaps like everyone else had done. And what are Jesus' first words? Are they, young man, you're condemned for allowing these spirits into your life. No. Or get your life corrected so that I can deal with you. No. His first words were, what is your name? He wasn't speaking to the spirits in there. The spirits answered, you know, they said, we are legion. He wasn't interested in them. In fact, he spoke to the man there. Jesus wanted to know who he was. He wanted to embrace this child of his. And he had to move the demons out of the way to do so. Jesus was looking into this man's heart and this man's soul. Perhaps the very first person who had ever done this when he said, look, who are you really? This man was corrupted. This man was soiled. This man was damaged beyond repair. This man was broken. This man was a problem. The demons had taken everything away from him. All that was left was a shell of a man. But where everyone else saw problems, where everyone else saw a madman, Jesus saw a child of God. This is the God of the Scriptures. The God who wants a relationship with us, with you and me. A God who looks what others may see in us, what others may view in us. The one who pushes aside all the junk that might destroy us. And he says to us, let me show you who you really are. Because you are my child. That's the God of the Scriptures. If you turn to Luke 19, there's another very familiar story. Tax collector Zacchaeus wasn't very popular with the people. He worked for the government, which is not a very popular thing to do anywhere. And he collected taxes. In fact, the Bible tells us in Luke 19 too, he was not only a tax collector, he was the chief tax collector. He was a big guy. Worked for the Roman government. And as a tax collector, it was accepted, it was understood that he determined what the taxes were and he would charge a bit more than that and keep himself. That's what they did. And Jesus came through that town and Zacchaeus heard that Jesus was coming. And so he, he, uh, he, his curiosity was piqued about this traveling man. And so, so Jack, Zacchaeus was vertically challenged. And, and couldn't see over the crowd. So as we know, he climbed up in a tree. Now Luke is recording this. Dr. Luke, who gives details. Luke even tells us the kind of tree he climbs up in. You know the song, he climbed up in a sycamore tree. And, and Luke says this. So he's up there, and we don't know if, if, if he was among the foliage there trying to hide. We don't know the story there. But he looks down on Jesus. And Jesus walks that way, and Zacchaeus is looking to see what he can see. And of course, you know the story. Jesus stops at that that sycamore tree and looks up and says, Zacchaeus, called him by name. I want you to come down because I must stay at your house today. The word must there in the original language I'm told is a very forceful word. It's, it's an irresistible compulsion. It's, it's being impelled, move forward. If you have a boat, you know that your propeller propels the boat. It pushes the water back so the boat can go forward. That's propelling. Impelling is moving forward. Christ was impelled to go to Zacchaeus. He was, he was, he was there, kind of like the father of the prodigal son, waiting for him to come home, scanning the horizon, waiting for the son to come. Christ was impelled to this man, Zacchaeus. Now, it's interesting, because Luke, Luke gives us details, but there's nothing in here. Luke doesn't tell us what happened in his home. And, and don't you know that if Jesus said something specific, Luke would have heard it in the home? Or, or maybe because they said Zacchaeus was a sinner and people didn't like him, maybe no one showed up. Maybe people didn't go in his home. Maybe it was a private meeting with Zacchaeus and Jesus. But we don't know, but we do believe, though, that, that Jesus did not condemn him for his deeds. Jesus probably did not correct him and tell him to get his life turned, turned right side up. 
We, we, we know nothing about what they talked about. They, they could have talked about the Old Testament prophets, perhaps. They, they could have chatted about the weather. They could have argued about their favorite sports team. They could have talked about politics because he worked for the Roman government. Jesus was a Jew. Politics was something they may have talked about. They could have swapped jokes. We don't know. We just don't know, but we do know the results. What compelled, what impelled Zacchaeus to announce that he would refund everybody all the money he cheated four times? What was it? We don't know what Jesus said. Perhaps not condemnation. Perhaps not correcting. Perhaps I would challenge, I would argue that perhaps the change that was brought about in Zacchaeus' life was simply because Jesus captivated his heart. Jesus embraced him and captivated him and, and his life was forever altered because he was in the presence of Jesus. Jesus just wanted to be with him. And Zacchaeus discovered that all his past failures, all his brokenness, all the, the, the sin he had done was no barrier for God, Jesus, to get through to him and change his life. So, between the covers of Scripture, we have a picture here. We have a picture of God's yearning to be with us, yearning to be with you. God's overwhelming love for you and for me. God's transforming grace that changes lives and has changed many of your lives. And it helps us to experience Him, to embrace Him. Yes, there are times when he has to address sin. Paul talks about the fact, and, and when he talks to Philippians, he says, work out your own salvation. Yes, there's part of that too. We are accountable. Yes, that's true. But if we wish to experience God, if we wish to encounter God, if we wish Christ to captivate us, there's no magic pill that makes this happen. Look into Scripture, and God may speak to you in ways you've never heard Him before. Your world might be turned upside down, Pain might work its way to the surface. It may not be easy, but if you read his words seeking his love and seeking his grace, you will find the God of grace and the God of love in the pages of Scripture. God wants to be with you. Accept his holy hug today. And let him embrace you. Let him surround you with his grace. Let him surround you with his love. And let him surround you with his, his acceptance. We're going to see a very brief song here, a song 325. The words will be on the screen, of course. Spirit of eternal love, guide me or I blindly rove. Set my heart on things above. Draw me after thee. Earthly things are paltry show, phantom charms, they come and go. Give me constantly to know fellowship, embracing fellowship with thee. As we sing this first verse and chorus, very, very briefly, if you would like to come here and, and embrace and engage with the Lord here, feel free to do that. The Lord wants to engage you and embrace you wherever you are in your spiritual walk. Whether you've walked with him for decades or whether you're just learning about how to do so, he wants to embrace you with a holy hug. And he wants you to receive his mercy and his grace and his love. And he knows your name. Let's sing this, shall we? On the first verse and the chorus. And come, of course, speak soon.
eyes. Let the Lord speak to our hearts as he says to you, I want to give you grace. I want to give you mercy. I want a relationship with you. I want to hug you and embrace you. Let the Lord speak to our hearts this morning for just a few moments as we hear the piano play that melody for us. Father, we thank you that your word to us is a word of love and grace and mercy and embrace. We thank you that you want a relationship with us. You want fellowship with us. You want us to grow with your guidance and your leading you want to walk with us every day, every moment of every day and guide us and strengthen us. And God, we may be tempted sometimes to think that, that uh, you're a God of, of judgment, God of condemnation or of correction. But God, may we be just compelled, may we just receive your embrace and love this morning. Thank you for your word that speaks to us. Thank you for your Holy Spirit who communes with us and guides us and walks us through a knowledge of you. Father, bless us today as we continually strive to walk with you and have fellowship with you. For it's in your holy and your precious name we pray. Amen.